I don't get up and down those steps as easily as I used to. I guess I'm uh, not only unfamiliar with technology, I tear it up too. I want to express how grateful I am for the invitation to be with you in this series of gospel meetings. It's a great honor to be with you in this congregation knowing your loyalty to Christ, to the truth, to the spread of the gospel. And it's also a, a great privilege to uh, be able to stay with Karen and, uh, well, Michael too, I guess. <clears throat> but he's right about my brain being in remission. Especially when him and my wonderful wife, who's with me and she goes with me everywhere, when they got to talking about computers and those things, I don't even know enough to listen. <laughs> you see, I'm, I'm right about that. But no, it is, it is a great privilege to be with you. We've been with you in the lectureships before. Look forward to that again. And I must say that of all of the places that I can think of where I would just be overjoyed to be invited to come in a gospel meeting, Bellevue would be right up at the top of that list. So I thank you for that. I thank you for the hospitality. And very seriously, and we appreciate Brother Michael and, and Sister Karen having us in their home. So we'll begin this morning with our second lesson in this series, and I think that you will agree when you look at the topics that this is indeed a series. We are going step by step and taking a look at how it is that we journey from earth to heaven. There is a number of sources of evidence, of testimony of God, His existence, His power, His authority, and yes, His love. And one of those sources of testimony is the creation. There are really three primary classes of people who deny the existence of God. There is the individual who says, I know that God does not exist. He is an atheist. Let me say that he cannot know that God does not exist. That's an impossibility. He would have to be in all places at all times to know that God does not exist, and no one can do that. Then there is the person who doubts the evidence that God exists. He's skeptical of the evidence the reliability of the evidence. And then there is the person who says, well, we have some evidence, but we do not have enough evidence to know whether or not God exists. And he's an agnostic. He's against the knowledge that we have. But the fact of the matter is, there are many evidences of the existence of God, and those evidences are 
irrefutable. It is impossible to overturn those evidences or to come to any other conclusion than God is. That is, if an individual is willing to be honest and to look at that evidence as it truly is. The Bible itself is one of those evidences or sources of evidence. How in the world can a book written over approximately 1,600 years or so with about 40 different human penmen be written and not a contradiction in it? It's impossible for 40 men to write of their own volition, of their own doing, about the same subject and not have some contradiction. We see the truth of that when we read about science or anything else. But there are no contradictions in this book. Only God can be the source of that. Brother Michael mentioned that I do some writing. Tell you what, sometimes I contradict myself in some of the writing that I do. But there are no contradictions here. Another source is this creation. This world in which we live and the sky is above, they are evidence of the existence of God. Evolutionary scientists claim that the universe began some 13.798 billion years ago, plus or minus 0.37 billion years. And the 0.37 is a result of one violent act called the Big Bang. But it never has made any sense to me how a Big Bang could result in such orderliness, in such beauty, in such a lawful place, if you will. It's never made any sense. After all, and we'll use a little bit of a different illustration, even though you've heard it many times, Explosion in a steel mill has yet to result in the erection of a bridge over the Mississippi River. And you can take my word for it that it's not going to happen. So how in the world can this creation that we see around us be the result of an accident? How in the world can I look at my human body and know that this re brain that's in remission can tell my fingers to move like this and they move like this. And that not be the result of a God in heaven who created this body. And yes, it's brain. Can't be. This world in which we live has inherent characteristics that declare the existence of the world and the stars, and the moon, and the sun, and the heavens above, all of these things were the result of the mighty hand of God. Would take, like to take a, just a brief look at three of those characteristics. The beauty, the orderliness, and the lawfulness of this creation. And then having done that, we'll notice how these characteristics testify of the glory, the power, the wisdom, 
the love and the authority of the God who made them. Let's begin by looking a little bit at the beauty of this creation. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Where all the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Exodus 20, 11. Psalm 19, 1 through 4. The psalmist wrote, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone after all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Consider a combination of these verses from the book of Psalms. Psalm 8, 3, 136, 9, 147, 4, and 148, verse 3. When I consider thy heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, the moon and stars to rule by night, for its mercy endureth forever. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Praise Him, ye sun, moon. Praise Him, all ye stars of light. In Isaiah 40, verse 22, the prophet wrote, It is He that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. There is that familiar New Testament verse of Romans 1, and verse 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Paul reminded the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 40 and 41, that there are celestial bodies, and there are bodies terrestrial. The glory of the celestial is, or celestial is different from that of the terrestrial. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another in glory. In these passages, don't we get a view of the beauty of this creation? But don't we get a perfect view of the beauty of this creation with our own eyes? There are some places in this world that are just almost beyond man's ability to comprehend how they could have been made so beautifully until he considers the Almighty God. There's the Marjan de Cole River in the Himalayas. Or Lake Kawaguchi, that's at the foot of Mount Fuji in Japan. You've never seen a picture of Rayleigh Beach in Thailand. Look it up on the internet. Beautiful. In our own country, we have sites such as the Grand Canyon. One of the most awesome looking places that I've ever been is the Royal Gorge, Colorado. Walking out on that bridge and looking down so far below, and then looking out across the span. What a beautiful world it is in which we live. It's absolutely incredible to me that people can look at those places and they can say, oh, they just happened by accident. No. 
They are handprints. The handprints of the God who made them all. What a beautiful world it is in which we live. But what an orderly creation it is in which we find ourselves. Seasons follow one another. God made it that way. What would happen if suddenly one year winter followed spring? Don't go out and look for any peaches on the peach tree. The trees would be dead before they bore their fruit. We may not be flawless at predicting the weather. And any of us who, who watches the, the weather forecast on the evening news knows how true that is. But one thing we do know, that if certain atmospheric conditions are this way, and they produce this result, those same conditions that are uh, present again are going to result in the same results. I mean, there may be a little bit of difference, sure, but because of the extent of the thing. But basically, they're going to result in the same thing. Because it is an orderly universe. It is an orderly world. And it's amazing when you look at Genesis chapter 1, and you note the order in which God made things. And one of the things that's very interesting there is how God made the plants before He made the sun, the moon, and stars. And someone says, well, how can that be? Now, why would it be? Remember, God already created light. He'd already done that. But do you think it might be possible that God did it that way to prove that these people who say each day was a long, long eon of time might be proven wrong by that fact? It is an orderly universe in which we live. And it's not surprising that God made man on the sixth day after He had made everything else that would prepare this place as a profitable and proper place for us to inhabit. He made everything that we needed, and then He made us. It's an orderly place. There was an occasion when the order was suspended. In 2009, NASA scientists discovered an almost missing day in the past. Actually, it was 23 hours and 20 minutes in length. Now hear this. Then spake Joshua, said Joshua 10, 12 through 14. Then spake Joshua to the Lord, in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down. Watch this now. About, about a whole day. 23 hours and 20 minutes, according to those NASA scientists. God calls that. He suspended the order. About a whole day. Not 24 hours, according to the NASA scientists, but 23 hours and 20 minutes. And according to Joshua, about a whole day. That one thing testifies of God. So the beauty, the orderliness, and now 
the lawfulness of the universe declare the existence of God. Admittedly, when we talk about the lawfulness of the universe, it's very similar to the orderliness of the universe. But consider this. If you go over to uh, Escambia Bay and find the highest spot that you can on Magnolia Bluff and jump off, you're going to go down and not up because of the law of gravity. That's the law of God. It's not a law of man. It's not a law of accident. It's the law of God. Last winter, and we mentioned this in our class hour this morning, we had a lot of cold weather in southwest Missouri. We also had some snow. And when that snow fell, we had quite a number of days where the temperature stayed well below freezing. And you know the strangest thing, as long as those temperatures stayed below freezing, that old snow stayed out there on the ground. It didn't melt. But then finally the temperatures rose, and it wasn't long until the snow had gone away. This is a lawful universe and earth. And God made it that way. God made the laws by which this earth keeps on going in the cycles and the seasons. And day following night, it always does. So we have the beauty and the orderliness, the lawfulness of creation. And they show, they point to certain things about God. They show us the glory of God, the splendor the magnificence, the majesty of God, if you will. The beauty of this universe is a reflection of the God who made it. An art critic can look at an original artwork and without looking at the signature, he can tell you whose work it was. But how can he do that? Because every artist has those unique things about his paintings that identify his work. Maybe it's the color combination. Maybe it's the brush strokes and the way they were done. Or maybe it's a combination of those and, and some other things. Things that those critics know about that I'm not familiar with. But they know them. And they can say it was that painter who painted that painting. Sometimes they're discovering new paintings and they don't know for sure if it's original or not, but it's got the, it's got the uh, uh, master's name on the bottom of it. And they have to look and examine that painting to say for sure, yes it is or yes, it's someone else's. It's a copy. We can look at this universe and we can see the handiwork of God all through it. And it points to His glory because untouched by a human hand, what a glorious place this is. All we have to do is go and look at one of those beautiful places that we talked about earlier or somewhere else. Last Sunday morning, we were driving 
from southwest Missouri down to Stillwell in Oklahoma. And as we were driving along, at one point for a number of miles, you could see the rays of the sun coming down through the clouds. There was about six or seven distinct rays that you could see in going through those clouds. And I couldn't help but keep one eye on the road and, and one eye on that. It was magnificent and it pointed to the glory of God as many things do. When we look at the towering mountains, the height, splendor, of something like Niagara Falls, those reveal something to us about the splendor, the majesty, the glory of the God who created us. But they also demonstrate the power of God. Could you or I have spent, or could we now spend, say, a hundred years and build something like the Grand Canyon? There's no way we can do that. Any of these beautiful spots on earth, we couldn't do that. But God did. What's more, it didn't take God hundreds of years. But what did God do? God spoke and it was. It's called fiat creation. It was all created by the Word of God. The power of God. It's visible when we see the ocean tides, when we see the volcanoes erupt, or an earthquake. Yes, those things are devastating, but they're powerful. But they're not near as powerful as the God who made this universe. There's no way that an accident could have caused. The creation demonstrates the power of God. But it also demonstrates the wisdom of God. The things that God created worked together in order to bring about the result that God intended. Plants, animals, and humans have a process assigned to them that results in a new individual of the same kind. It's the wisdom of God. The water of the hydrological cycle plays a necessary role in sustaining life as we know it. Not only that, the water cycle involves an exchange of energy, which leads to temperature changes. For instance, when water evaporates, it takes up energy from its surrounding and cools environment. When it condenses, it releases energy, warms the environment. That shows the wisdom of God, doesn't it? Sure it does. From the most obvious to the most obscure essentials, God thought of it all. All that we need for this world to be a fit place for us to live. And it required thought. It demanded mind to create this world. Thus, mind came before matter. That's God. But this creation demonstrates the love of God, too. I'm very happy on the one hand that 
we have decided to move down to the Steelwell area where we have. And you know one of the reasons why? I love the mountains. I love the big, beautiful trees. I love the streams of water that flow from those mountains. And when there are places like that, it is a testimony to me that God loves me because He made places like that where I want to live. Because they suit my eyes. They, 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 they appeal to me. This creation shows that God loves us. But how beautifully it's stated in Acts 14, 17. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good, gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. Those fruit trees that God created, all those plants that bear the food that we love so much and that's healthy for us, good for us, God made those. He made them for us. He told us He did. He demonstrates His love. Jesus said He makes His Son to rise on the evil and on the good and His rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Matthew 5.45 Indeed, as Paul declared to the Athenians, in Him we live and move. Have our being in Acts 17. Truly, when God made Adam and Eve the coats of skin to cover their nakedness, He was showing His love. Even though they had disobeyed Him. The things of this world demonstrate the love of God. So you know what all of these things do finally and ultimately so far as our lesson this morning is concerned? They remind us of the authority of God. We've looked at those verses that tell us how the things that God created honor in Him and they glorify Him. And they praise Him. Why would they do that? God made them. God said, For every beast of the forest is mine. And the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all of the fowls of the mountains. And the wild beasts of the fields are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Psalm 50, 10 through 12. God did. And so he's in charge. He's the authority over all of these things. Paul said, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Colossians 1.16. Created by Him and for Him? Yes. God is the authority. God is the Creator. We are the creature. And because we are His creatures, He has authority over us. If you go purchase a dog, have him trained, he does tricks for you. You don't do tricks for him. Well, I've seen comedians do that before, but the dog does tricks for us. We're the master. He's the pet. He belongs to us. We don't belong to Him. 
at least in the minds of those who still have common and rational sense nowadays, to some others, I, I wonder sometimes. But we are in charge because we are His Master. We are over Him. God is in charge. God has the authority because He made us. So the creation tells us all of these things. But there's one thing that the creation does not tell us. Oh, it tells us that we ought to obey God. That we ought to please our Creator. But it doesn't tell us how. So, what does? Well, you may remember back that we read from Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4. But if you drop down to verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony is sure. Making wise the simple. Paul said that there were those who saw the work of God's hand and they tried to direct their own steps. That's what I get from Romans 1.21. Their foolish heart was darkened. They honored the creature rather than the Creator. And so when Paul concludes at the end of that chapter, that long list of sins, then you go on into chapter 2, and you find that he says those who do such things are worthy of death. So how do I please this Creator? I don't do it by following the imaginations of my own heart. I do that which is instructed by Him to me in His Word. What's the law of God? So Paul describes it in Romans 7, 22. It's the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. He describes it in the next chapter. Chapter 8, verse 2. It is the law of Christ. Galatians 6, verse 2. There are those that don't like this word law, but it's there. James calls it both the royal law and the law of liberty. James 2, 8 and verse 12. It's the law of God that tells us how to please Him. Jesus says that all authority hath been given unto me. Matthew 28, 18. All authority. Remember how they used to question Him? By what authority do you do these things and who gave you this authority? It is amazing, isn't it? that they could see Him heal the blind, the lame, the maimed, and raise the dead. And then said, who gave you this authority? As we often say, it's so plain a blind man could see it. God gave him that authority. Now he says, just before he leaves this earth, all authority hath been given unto me, in heaven and on earth. So what did he tell the disciples after saying that? Go preach the gospel. As Brother Michael said earlier, that's our responsibility. Go preach the gospel. And then it's the responsibility of those who hear it to respond as God and as Christ say that we must respond to it. 
What did Jesus say? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Commanding them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. For teaching them to observe all things. Jesus promised his disciples that he would send the Holy Spirit to, to re, bring back to their remembrance all that he had said to them and to guide them in all the truth. And he did just that. And so the Apostle Paul writes in those very familiar verses to us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, and not anything left out there. To put it another way, it is God who tells us what we must do in order to get from this place where we live now on the earth and to one day live in that eternal home of heaven. From earth to heaven. God tells us how to make that journey. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Mark records it that way, doesn't he? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And so we began at that point and we, we looked through at how the apostles used those keys of the kingdom that Jesus promised them back there in Matthew 16. And they used those keys on that day of Pentecost to open the door to the kingdom. And we're going to talk about the kingdom later. And he told them what they had to do in order to enter that kingdom to repent of their sins, and to be baptized for the remission of those sins. And then Acts 2.47 tells us that they were added to the church. You're here this morning, and you've seen this creation. You've seen this world in which we live. Some of us have seen a little bit more of it than others, but we've all seen enough of it to know of the glory, the majesty, the power, the authority, and the love of God. And it's that love of God that sent Jesus to this earth to make salvation possible for us. And it was that love of Christ that sent Him to the cross. If you've never obeyed the gospel of Christ, that you might have forgiveness of your sins and enter into that kingdom that it has was prepared by God. It brought into being. Then you need to do that. Maybe you have obeyed those first principles as we refer to them properly so. But your life has not reflected that which God would have you to do. Well, you can look at the beauty of this world. You can say, you know, I haven't, I haven't uh, submitted myself to the authority of God as I know I should. But you have to look into His Word where it says, if you have done that which is wrong as my child, then you need to confess that. You need to turn from that. You need to ask me for it my forgiveness. And if that sin which we've committed is done publicly, then it needs a public confession and the prayers of brethren. You may be subject to the invitation this morning to obey the first principles of the gospel of Christ or to be restored to that great and wonderful fellowship that's God's people. If you're subject, we would invite you to come as we stand and as we sing.